Thank you very much for the invitation. It's a pleasure to be my talk. Uh, what I see on the screen is uh, that this meeting is being recorded. I just click on got it. Yeah, that's okay, Alexander. Okay. And uh, I hope that you can see my screen. <clears throat> so this is uh, a talk that's addressed to a large uh, audience, not to the experts. Although I already see a few names. Oh, okay. So, so we already have lots and lots of experts in this area. Now, if anybody has a question, please address them directly. Um, let me start. So we all know uh, Dirichlet's famous theorem that in any arithmetic progression where we could, we can have, or we may have uh, infinite many primes, we do have infinite many primes. So more precisely, if we take uh, two numbers, two integer numbers, A and D, and D is, and they are relatively prime, the greatest common divisor is one, then there are infinitely many primes in this arithmetic progression. Um, one step in the proof is to show that L1 chi uh, is not zero for any non principal character, of course. Uh, Dirichlet used his so Dirichlet functions and made uh, linear combinations of them, of their logarithmic derivatives, and he was able to um, estimate, so to speak, uh, certain sums involving primes in a given arithmetic progression. But then the main contribution would come from the, from, from let's say, from the Riemann zeta function that would correspond to the uh, principal character, but the uh, um, and of course, zeta of one, it's, it's, um, it's not defined. Zeta has a pole there. We have the main contribution coming from zeta. But then in principle, this might cancel with contribution coming from uh, other delay characters if, if they vanish there. So then the logarithmic derivatives will have uh, poles themselves. Now, uh, so he, he showed that uh, this doesn't happen. He also developed his uh, also very famous class number formula. Say D is larger than four. I talk about an um, imaginary quadratic number field and H of uh, say of minus D is the, the class number. And it counts the number of classes. This is a, a finite number, but it's strictly positive. So this H being strictly larger than, uh, than zero, or it's larger than or equal to one. That's one way to prove that L1 chi D is uh, uh, strictly positive, so it doesn't vanish. And then not only this, but it's at least one over uh, or pi over the square root D. Now, if we can develop some theory, which we show that L1 chi, it's non-zero, and it's not small, and this will give us a way to show that the class number is large. Say if, if L is of the size of L1 chi, say is of the size of one, five, something like this, uh, then H will be forced to be of the size of square root D. Um, so this class number formula relates uh, the special value of the L function, this particular L function, to the class number of this uh, quadratic uh, number field. And as I said before, we have this uh, unconditional bound that L1 chi is larger than, larger, larger means larger than a constant times one over square root D. In what follows, we'll, uh, I will just write chi for a, a real primitive uh, Dirichlet character mod D. So this takes values that are uh, real. The values are zero, one, and minus one, because if the values are not zero, they're also roots of unity at the same time. What should hold true is that L1 chi or chi d, so this is a, this chi depends on d. Now it's larger than something like one over log log, it's less than something like a log log times various constants. This is assuming the, the generalized Riemann hypothesis. 
unconditionally one can show that the value of the Dirichlet uh, L function at one is, these values are bounded by a log. But lower bounds are much harder to obtain. And the reason is that we cannot, we don't know, I shouldn't say we, let me say I, don't know how to rule out a, a possible, say hypothetical zero, let's call it beta of LS, LS chi, with beta close to one. And uh, if I may go back to this, just think about L as chi. So I have a variable, a complex variable S here and I let S equals one. Now, if I let S equals beta and beta is less than one, but extremely close to one. And if it's zero, so if beta is zero, what we call uh, lambda of zero, zero, then the value of a function at one cannot be too large. It has to be small, unless the derivative grows very fast. But as I said, the function and the derivative, you can always give upper bounds for this. So just by these remarks, we can see that the, if there are Landau Siegel zeros, they cannot be too close to one. So this beta cannot be closer than uh, let's say a distance uh, smaller than something like a one over square root. Cannot be uh, closer like a distance one over d. Uh, let me jump over a few other remarks. I will also send uh, the organizers uh, my slides. So if you want to look at them later, but let me, let me go a bit faster over this. Uh, the classical zero free region looks like this. There's no zero of any Dirichlet function. Say chi now is a character uh, mod Q uh, in a region like this with a possible one exception so, um, where the sigma, where S is sigma plus IT. Sigma is the real part, T is the imaginary part. And um, in a region like where the real part is so close to one, a distance uh, smaller than a constant over log T or log QT. All right. In particular, if I take T to be zero and I look at these real zeros, um, we don't have zeros for these Dirichlet functions that are a distance less than a constant over log Q, distance from one, with a possible exception of one zero. Let me make it clear. For one Dirichlet function, we may have one exception. If this Dirichlet character is not real, and we don't have any exceptions, we have a proof. If this is a real character, we may have one exception, but it doesn't mean that every single real character uh, can produce an exception. So, and in fact, we know that uh, this land of single zeros, if they exist, uh, they form a sequence that's very, very sparse. Uh, proves like this, that they kind of repel each other very nicely. Um, <clears throat> well, uh, if we don't have any zero, no real zero in the classical zero free region, uh, Heck has shown that L1 chi is larger than a constant over log D. And this gives a very good bound, lower bound for these, uh, the class number in particular, it would solve say the so-called class number problem. Now what we know uh, um, still unconditionally, but with possible exceptions, or in other words, with uh, ineffective constants there, are results of Landau and Siegel. You see both of them are from 1935. In fact, uh, I look at the papers and they came in Arithmetica, one after another very quickly. So as soon as Landau came up with uh, some uh, ideas there and he obtained this unconditionally, then Siegel got some some additional ideas and you prove this thing. So uh, theorem of Siegel, where 
uh, L1 chi is unconditionally larger than a constant depending on epsilon over d to the epsilon. This holds true for any epsilon c larger than zero, but the constant c of epsilon might be large when epsilon is small. We have no idea. And not only that, but this is not effective, not even in principle. So we don't solve the class number problem in this way. Uh, the um, best effective lower bound that I know it comes from work of Goldf uh, Goldfeld and uh, that it's combined with, with the work of uh, Gross Zagier of this size, that the class number is larger than uh, the log. It's not exactly like this. Um, the sharpest uh, inequalities that I've seen out of this form, a constant, absolute constant, and the log of this d and the product over primes dividing d that look like this. And um, this allows, in principle, to solve the uh, class number, say, class number equal h, you give, uh, you give us an h, and we should be able to find the finitely many uh, class numbers, the finite, finally many, many imaginary quadratic number fields with this class number. Now, um, there are many nice and famous results that involve Landau signal zeros in one way or another. For instance, the theorem of Linick um, that in any arithmetic progression that there is an absolute constant L uh, such that in any arithmetic progression with AD relatively prime, there are primes congruent to A mod D that are small. Like if you look for, if you look at the first prime, it's less than a certain power of D and this L is, is an absolute constant here. And then the best uh, uh, results so far or the current record as far as I know is A equals five in here. Of course, we know we expect much better, um, uh, much stronger uh, results to hold true uh, under the assumption of the, the generalized Riemann hypothesis, assume uh, the Riemann hypothesis for the Riemann zeta function as well as for all the uh, L functions, then L is less than you can take L to be two plus epsilon. So, like, like for instance, if I well, I want to find the first prime in a given arithmetic progression modulo D, and IGRH we will be able to find such a prime less than D, D squared, or say D to the two plus epsilon. So it's very interesting that uh, Finland and Ivan were able to show, but now assuming uh, the existence of a, a single zero or a longer single zero, in certain ranges. So this lambda single zeros have effect in certain ranges, so without being very precise, but this, they, they push this below two. So in some sense, they go, this goes beyond GRH. And there are other results like this that people will say they are illusory results because we do not think that there are any lambda sequence zeros. I don't think that, there are, that any lambda sequence zeros exist. In fact, I think that the GRH holds true, the generalizing hypothesis holds true. And then of course there are no, uh, Siegel, there are no zeros where they shouldn't be. I mean, all the zeros are like uh, trivial zeros and then the non-trivial zeros should be on the critical line. Um, but why prove such results? Well, one reason is that sometimes you can prove a result assuming existence of a lambda single zero and then you can prove a result assuming that no, uh, lambda sequence zeros exist and you combine the two proofs and you can uh, get an unconditional result. But also such, such theorems allow us to, to test the strength of, uh, of this hypothesis, lambda sequence zeros exist. And there are many in the literature. Uh, and they also allow us to measure, say, the strength of the, the present tools of the current technology. And very quickly to mention a few of them, not precisely, um, besides this, that's mm, like the first thing, okay, that you observe is that if you look at, if you have a, you look at the modulus and look at uh, the primes in the various arithmetic progressions, modulo, uh, that modulus, if 
you look at the if you look at all the Dirichlet characters modulo that number D and then somewhere there there may be a real character that has a lambda of equal zero, and that may distort this distribution quite a lot. Like half of the arithmetic relations may have very few primes, and then the other half may, may have like uh, twice as many, almost twice as many. Now, if uh, another uh, result of very nice and famous result of Heath Brown, uh, for instance, there are infinitely many twin primes, but what do you assume to get this? It's not enough to assume the existence of one lambda of sigma zero. As I said, it has influence in a certain range, but if you assume an infinite sequence of lambda sigma zeros, then you can get this very uh, surprising result. Other type of results, if you have, if you look at primes in short intervals. So if I take a large number X, now how soon after X we can find, can we find the prime? Of course, we expect to find the prime in an interval of, of the size log square of X, say things like this. Well, we don't know this. Uh, Assuming the Riemann hypothesis, then we can get results of this form in intervals of the size x, x plus square root x, not exactly square root x, let's say x to one half plus epsilon, or maybe square root x times some logs there. Then assuming uh, the Riemann hypothesis, I mean, assuming Riemann hypothesis for the Riemann zeta function, yes. Then you can prove the existence of such primes. So this exponent one half here, or the length of the interval, is, is important, then we can do something if this is larger. And again, as I said, uh, I said uh, RH gives one half plus epsilon. And again, there is a context in which uh, Friedlari variants are able to show, assuming existence of lambda equal zero, that you can find primes in smaller intervals. You see, it's one half minus something smaller than that. Another very nice. Uh, Result of them, but again, assuming if you assume the sequence of existence of uh, sequences of lambda sigma zeros, then you can find primes in such. Uh, <laughs> this is a striking result: primes of this four a to the six plus d squared. In particular, you can apply this to this discriminant to find the uh, elliptic curves with one and only one place of bed reduction as an application. Uh, let me jump over a few other uh, results. Uh, of course, uh, existence, hypothetical existence of lambda sigma zeros will distort um, so-called pair correlation, pair correlation function. So in Montgomery's pair correlation function. It was studied by Montgomery, studied by Hildebrand, also studied by more recently, I mean, more recently still, some time ago, uh, Conrad Ivanez. Um, results are, for instance, this, this result of Conrad Ivanez is kind of pushed to the limit. And it shows that if you, you see, at least if you, if, you, if you assume the existence of lambda sigma zeros, uh, then at least half, then uh, the distance between zeros will be at least almost always will be at least half the average space. So why are these results very interesting? Because suppose someone comes in with a new idea and shows that unconditionally that you don't have, you cannot have this. Because we do expect a uh, positive proportion of zeros to be uh, distances between consecutive zeros of the Riemann zeta function to be uh, larger than the average distance a positive proportion to be like uh, less than the average distance, still a positive proportion to be less than one tenth of the average distance. You have um, say a clean conjecture, this uh, pair correlation conjecture. And in general, this, this model will predict uh, things like this. So if you combine this uh, with something like that, then you, it would show that there are no lambda sigma zeros. Oh, and I want to mention another result of uh, Peter Sarnak and myself, uh, 20 years old, is that uh, 
is sequences of Landau Siegel zeros. Again, I'm not going to state the result precisely, the result precisely, but I'm happy to talk, uh, say, separate with anybody who wants to, uh, who's interested in any of this, or in particular in this, in this uh, result and uh, discuss the actual results that are in the paper. But uh, what, is, what the results say uh, is the following that sequences of lambda Siegel zeros cannot exist by themselves without additional sequences of complex uh, zeros of some, maybe other uh, Dirichlet functions. That's basically. So in other words, if you assume, let's say we assume GRH, so we assume the generalized demand hypothesis for all, non-trivial zeros of all Dirichlet functions, except we allow any Dirichlet function to have as many real zeros as it wants, so to speak. So assume GRH except for possible zero, uh, real zeros of all these zero functions, then we can show that there are no sequences of lambda sigma zeros. That, that was the result there. Now, a uh, couple of uh, ideas here. Uh, something about the mechanism here. Well, one thing that happens if we assume the existence of a lambda sigma zero of LS chi, say we fix a chi that's a, um, a real character, and LS chi has a zero very close to uh, as, as equals to one. Then one thing that you can show is that this force is that chi of P is minus one for most primes. Now, heuristically, uh, let's just say, if you think about the Euler product that gives LS chi is the product over all the primes, one minus chi of P over P to the S, that would be the Dirichlet uh, series, except that now I'm kind of computing it at S equals one. So it's one minus chi of P over P to the S to the minus one. Now, anytime I have chi of P equals one, so I have an infinite product here over all primes. For each prime, if we take primes in order, there are primes for which chi of P is one, there are primes for which chi of P is minus one, there are primes for which chi of P is zero, a few of them maybe, those primes which divide our capital D, right? There are finally many, but the other, otherwise the primes are chi of P is one or chi of P is minus one. Now those primes for which chi of P is one, if you put a one here, you get a one minus one over P, that's less than one, but I have it to the minus one. So when you invert it, it's larger than one. So each one of these contributes to the product, a factor that's larger than one. So it increases the product. It makes the product large, but we are assuming that this number is small because we are assuming that LS chi has a lambda of zero, zero. So a zero close to one. So, so that forces L1 chi to be small. So in this sense, this forces uh, chi of P to be minus one for me. Say more rigorously, well, one can show something like this, unconditionally. So I have a D, I have a, a chi, that's a character, a real character modulo D, and we can prove unconditionally a result like this. It's a finite sum now. Okay, so I have two parameters. I have I have this capital D, it's fixed, and I have this uh, uh, lambda signal zero. Expecting, or, but this is this is unconditional. Whether or not we have a lambda signal zero, it doesn't matter. This still holds true. It still holds true. Uh, I take a parameter x and I take the sum of something over n. What that something is, just the uh, Dirichlet convolution. Uh, if we're more familiar with, say, Dirichlet series and multiplication of series, if I put an n to the s here and take the sum to infinity, this, this will be just a product between our ls chi and the Riemann zeta function. And if you look at the coefficients, that's what you get. The coefficients are non-negative, they are integer numbers. 
Now on the right side, I have the value L1 chi. It's multiplied by a log X. So this depends on X. A gamma is Euler's constant. Here is the derivative of our L function computed at one. And this is a narrow term that looks like this. It's like a power of these, like D to one over four log over square root X. So if I take X to be large compared to D, I don't even need to take X to be large compared to D. I can take X to be D. And I have a D to one of fourth in the numerator and I have a square root in the denominator. So the denominator will dominate the numerator. So this B go is less than one, it's small. Uh, this is constant, this is constant. The only one that should be large is the first part, L1 chi times the log X when X increases. But if I have a Landau sigma zero, then L1 chi is small. So this forces the small part to be small. So smaller than expected. Now, to be uh, precise, what we do, I take two values of X, and both of them are powers of capital D. Say I take D square and I take D to the A, and A is large. Uh, later on, maybe I take A to be 300. Well, let's say I take A to be uh, 100 here. And I take a sum. And I, and I, okay, and I subtract this, I compute this for X equals D to the 100 and I, or D to the A and I compute it for D squared and I subtract these things. What I see on the left side is just the sum of these numbers between D squared and D to the A. On the right side, I have error terms that are small and I have constant terms that cancel. So this constant L prime computed one chi has, there's, there's no X in it. Uh, this will cancel, then uh, the gamma um, here will cancel. So Euler's constant will cancel, this times L1 chi. And I'm just left with L1 chi times log X. So what I get is L1 chi times log X, uh, so I'm sorry, not log X, it's log of D to the A minus log of D squared. So the whole thing is less than log of D to the A. Now, if A is 100 or 1000, that's still small, as small as log D. Because log of D to the A will be equal to 100 log D or 1000 log D. Now, finally, if I have a Landau sigma zero, and if L1 chi is less than one over log cubed, and you multiply this by uh, uh, just a single log, the result will be less than one over log squared. If I assume that I have a worse lambda of sigma zero, so L1 chi is less than one over D to a thousand. Then I multiply by this poor single log and I still get a saving of one over log to the 999. So it depends how bad the lambda sigma zero is. We get a sharper, if much sharper inequality here. So this could be small if there is, a, so this will be small if there is a small lambda of sigma zero. On the, on the left side. Now, these are positive numbers or non-negative, in particular for primes. You see, for primes, this is just uh, one uh, plus chi of p. That's what it is. Let me put it here. Uh, one convolved chi of p is just one plus chi of p. Now, finally, if chi of p is one, it produces a two here. So it's two over two over P. The sum of one over P is of the size of one or the size of this. But in our case, it's much smaller if I have a lambda sigma zero. This is of the size of one over log to the 999, as I said. So this means that I that uh, the proportion in some sense, the proportion of my the price for which chi of P is one is much, much smaller. It's less than one over log to some power. All right, so in almost all cases for almost all primes, in this sense, the, the exceptional set is less than, uh, let's say, proportion, or the percentage of the exceptional set is small, it's less than one over some power of log. I have that chi of P is negative one. Now let's observe that the Möbius function at the prime is negative one. When the Möbius function at the, each prime is negative one. And the Möbius function is multiplicative. Our character is more than multiplicative, it's completely multiplicative. But on the other hand, it's not minus one at each prime, but it's minus one at most primes. 
So both, both of them being uh, multiplicativities, then for most square phi numbers, so numbers that are products of uh, distinct primes, they will match. So in most cases, because chi of P for, div for prime divisors P of N um, being minus one, chi of N will look like the Möbius function from Q to the N. So then LS chi will look like, like one over Z. But we have these things uh, in size. Now, I want to report on some uh, recent work, joint work with Hong Bui and uh, Kyle Pratt on um, uh, the influence of say hypothetical existence of lambda sigma zeros on some central values of L functions. I'm going to especially look at Dirich L functions. Um, but there was work done before and a lot. So now let's see. I'm going to do the following. I take two numbers. I have one modulus that's capital D, and I'm going to have a second modulus that's little q. Although this is big D and the other is little q, the little one is much larger for us. So our little q is a prime that's going to be much larger than this capital D. It's going to be like D to the 300 in that range. So uh, I'm saying these things in advance, so then we, we have some intuition. Now, for capital D, I have a single Dirichlet function, and this is our well, single, uh, the, the Dirichlet function associated to a, a quadratic uh, character, and the Dirichlet function is assumed to have lambda sigma zero. That's our assumption. And we want to, so this is about capital D. It has nothing to do with this little q. But we want, to, we want to show that this has influence some far away, not too far, but far away in the sense that it, um, it has influence for the values of these Dirichlet functions, L1. Uh, now I'm using another letter, psi, or psi, if you want psi, but I say psi, L is psi. And I look at all, all um, characters, psi modulo q. So I take a capital D and I take a larger q that is of the size of little q to some power, say between little q to 300 and little q to 1000, not much, much larger in that range. I have lots of primes. And for each prime, I do something. What I do is I look at all the, the Dirichlet functions associated to all these uh, characters, psi. So psi runs over all characters. In each case, I compute this, I compute LS chi, LS psi at S equals one half. It is believed that it is not zero. Uh, and in fact, it is, it is believed that it's never zero. Very single Dirichlet function L one half psi is expected to be non-zero. And um, there are results, there are unconditional results. They have nothing to do with lambda sigma zeros. So all these results have nothing to do with true theorems. So to speak. Our theorem is also true theorem, so to speak. But um, let's see, let me go quickly over them. Subramanian and Murthy show that a positive proportion of them, if you look at all the primitive uh, characters mod this little q, a positive proportion. I will be more precise later, but let's say a positive proportion is a positive proportion of them non-zero. Ivanis Sarnak showed at least 30%. That's about the third. Uh, Hungui introduced some, some refinements and showed that at least 34.11% when Q increases at least 34.11% of them are non-zero uh, at the central point. And very recently, because this, this is from 2012, very recently in 2020, Khan, Milicevic, and Go show that at least 38.46, if I'm not wrong, percent 
are non-zero of the central values of this L1 chi, uh, L1 one half and psi. Uh, and this is for uh, uh, primes, for, for Q prime. Uh, the other, the previous results hold true for all, uh, for general Q. What is known under the assumption of the Riemann hypothesis, uh, on, on GRH, one can show that at least 50%, let's put it this way, 50% of them are non zero. Now, these are all unconditional results, except for the last one that assumes the uh, generalized Riemann hypothesis. Our result here, uh, oh, okay, before I get to our result, Assume something else, assume the existence of lambda sigma zero. There are, uh, again, unconditional results on non vanishing of the derivatives of these functions at the point one half. So if either the function or the derivative, if one of them doesn't vanish, then we can at least conclude that the function cannot have a zero of order larger than one. Or if we show that at least one of the first three, four, five derivatives, don't vanish, then we know that the order of vanish is at most three, four, or one. So in that case, we can get larger percentages. Bui and Milinovic prove that, prove a lower bound on the proportion of psi for which the k derivative is non zero. And the lower bound is of the size of one minus a constant over k squared. I mean, it's at least one minus a constant over k squared. And in, in particular, the proportion goes to one as k goes to infinity. Uh, but here, of course, uh, first of all, you fix a k and you take your little q to go to infinity and you prove a lower bound. The lower bound depends on k. And then, um, and, and then once you look at your bound and look at the bounds and what happens with the bounds as k goes to infinity, you show that, or they show that this goes to one. Higher and higher percentage of this derivative won't vanish or the, the order of vanishing stays bounded by k. For example, if you, uh, they show that more than 75.44%, so more than three quarters, of them have at most a simple zero at s equals one. And if you look at at most a double zero, they have a higher percentage and so on and so on. So what we wanted to do was to look at the influence of our LS, uh, LS chi on these values from a bit far away, so to speak, because our capital D is much smaller than this little q. And we want to see if these influences, if we can get a better percentage. Our expectation was to be able to do much better under the assumption of this existence of lambda sigma zero. So the percentages here would go to one match much faster, but that's not interesting enough. What we wanted to see really was that if we can put our hand on a K, if we can provide a K, say K is five, such that the percentage is exactly one already when K is five. And we got this, result and we found that we can already get a uh, hundred percent here when k is one. So let me state the result. I don't I don't like to write in terms of percentages or anything. I, I write something uh, rigorously here. It's, it's all true like that. And in fact you don't have to assume the existence of lambda sequence. Okay. So unconditional result, but it's not useful unless you have a lambda sequence. It, it, it is an unconditional result. It says the following, fix a constant C larger than 300. I'm gonna take C to be uh, 1000, right? Here. Fix an epsilon for any epsilon. This is not the epsilon from uh, Siegel's theorem. It's in effect. I just take epsilon to be one half so, or one. Well, let me, let me take one epsilon to be one half. So this is fixed, everything is fixed. Now I take any prime, between any prime Q between D to the 300 and D to the 1000. 
for each prime q, I'm doing the following. I count, I write it as a sum, but it's just counting. I count a one each time I meet a Dirichlet function or a Dirichlet, Dirichlet character psi modulo q. That's primitive. This star here just means that we go over the primitive ones for which the value of the associated uh, Dirichlet function at one half is non-zero. We want to show that the high percentage of them is non-zero. So we want to show that this, the sum is large, as large as we can. We are not able to do it, but we, we get some results. Of course, we talk about uh, a percentage. So I take the total number, uh, so, so I, I count those for which the value at one, uh, the central point is non zero, but then I divide by the total number of, let's say, the total number of Dirichlet characters. Right. So I divide by uh, phi of q. And I get a number that's uh, between zero and one. And we want it to be as close to one as possible, but we don't get better anything better than one half. We get one half plus this plus is really a minus. Uh, because we don't get one half, we don't get that half of them, at least half of them, but almost half. We get one half minus something, and that something is big O of, meaning is bounded by a certain constant times what I see inside. The actual constant depends on epsilon and on C. But I already said I'm, for any practical purposes, I'm going to take a fixed epsilon, one half, and C it's 1,000. So that's a, that's a constant. Okay, there will be an absolute constant. And it's a constant times what? It's one over, I write it like this, typing purposes for us, it's easy. But it's one over square root of log, that's good, because when the Q increases, this is less, this goes to zero. So it won't affect our percentages one, one half. But the other one, you see, it's log Q to something large, and it's 22 over two. I put my epsilon, I add my epsilon is one half, it's what, 26 over two, that's 13. And I multiply this by L1 chi. Recall that this is not the C here, other side. This chi is our chi modulo D, modulo D. That's now, so finally, now we assume that we have a lambda sigma zero. If we don't assume that we have a lambda sigma zero, if this L1 chi is not, small, then we don't get any result. Because if, if this is just like a one and you multiply by a log, you don't get any result. Okay, but if we assume that we have a land of zero, zero um, pretty bad one, but not too bad. Say, if we assume that L1 chi is less than uh, one over log Q, or, sorry, not one over log Q. We don't make assumption on Q, we make assumption on capital D because chi was defined mod d. If we assume that L1 chi is less than one over, one over, I don't need to assume anything like one over square root d. No, it's enough to assume that L1 chi is less than one over log d to 100. You see this one over, you see by this inequalities here, you can see that the logs are of the same size, log q, is between 300 log d and 1000 log d. So they are of the uh, same size. So if our L1 chi is less than one over log d to the 100, this is gonna kill entirely whatever log I have here, log q to the 13. So we do get a non-trivial result. In some sense, this matches, this matches, um, the proportion that's obtained under this other assumption, GRH. This is just as strong as, uh, as the GRH, this result. But of course, GRH is something that we believe holds true. The uh, existence of under single zeros is something that we believe is not true. Now, suppose now we look at higher and higher derivatives computed at one half. Um, as I said, it's enough to look at the first derivative. And then the, 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 percentage, the percentage jumps directly from 50% to 100% already. So assume the same hypothesis as in the previous result. 
uh, of course, this is a, a joint work, as I said, with uh, Hung and Kyle. Uh, then the number of characters, psi mod q, such that this has a multiple zero, so a zero larger of order larger than or equal to two is bounded by this. And there's a typo here. It's not the, the number. I take the number of such characters. I divide by the total number, divide by phi of q. The total number is bounded by phi of q times this. And then it's also bounded by q times this. So it's less than q over the square root of uh, plus q over this. So you see, um, it says that in this more precise sense, that almost all characters are such that L as chi has at most a simple zero. But we are not able to say for, for this 100% of, of them, for almost all of them, what happens that makes it to have a um, vanishing order at most one? Is the function that's, that's not zero at the central point or is the derivative? what happens from a technical point of view, we look at a certain combination, a certain linear combination between the, the function and its derivative. And that linear combination computed there at the central point, we can show that it's non-zero almost always, meaning the exceptional set is bounded by this. So that, that's actually what happens. But because we don't know if it's a function, what is the, the derivative uh, that, non, that vanishes um, we write it like this. Now I see I only have like a one minute or two minutes. Uh, there's another family that we studied in a more recent uh, paper. We look at new forms of weight two, le uh, prime level Q, and the associated uh, L functions now are self-dual and they have, a, they have a root number that's one or minus one. Now, if it's, if it's minus one, and if you, they, these root numbers appear in the functional equation, and when they appear in the functional equation, they force the, and if it's minus one, then of course it forces the function to vanish at that point. Not only to vanish at that point, but if the root, uh, the root number is minus one, it forces the L function to have an odd order of vanishing. It's an odd function around that point. And we look at what's called the analytic rank of this. So the order of vanishing. Now, the analog of the previous result where we take higher and higher derivatives and you're you sure that they, they start at the higher and higher percentage uh, are non-vanishing. In this uh, uh, more difficult uh, case, this was done by Kowalski, Michel, and Van der Kamp, and they showed that the percentage of Fs for which the analytic rank is less than or equal to k goes to one as k goes to infinity. Uh, there are clear conjectures. We know what to conjecture and uh, Bruver and, and Morty conjectures very clearly, basically, so I can finish in a, in a minute this thing, uh, that those that don't have to vanish kind of don't vanish. So those that, that are, those that the, those Fs that are even, or we say the um, the sign in the functional equation is plus one, are not forced to vanish at the central point, and the conjecture is some of them may vanish, but a small percentage, like uh, that's zero percentage, they have some some. Uh, clean conjectures, okay. And those that are the, 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 those, those that are odd uh, have to vanish there, at least for the one. But the conjecture is that, okay, most of them do vanish uh, and the order vanish is one, those that are odd. A deep result, and actually it's a very deep problem. There's a deep result, but much deep, deeper than their work, uh, uh, Henrik and Peter's work, is the actual problem because they push this to the limit. Um, they show that if you can improve on these percentages, they get even a little bit, there's no time to talk about that, but if you improve this percentage even a little bit, uh, then you show that there are no longer zero zeros at all. 
That's a striking result. I just uh, finished by st uh, stating our result uh, in an imprecise, Im imprecise uh, form like this. Uh, we assume now the existence of a lambda sigma zero and see what we can say about the percentage. And uh, if we assume a lambda sigma zero in some range, again, uh, we look at, we look at um, our capital D and again, we have a prime the level is little q. And again, our, the prime will, have, will be between d to 100, d to the 300 or something, something like that. And again, we show that the analytic uh, rank is at most one. Okay, if chi of q is one. And uh, that's basically the result that is interesting. The analytic rank, Regardless of chi of q is one or minus one, which is subtle, okay? I'm saying that in all cases, the, the analytic rank is at most two in 100% of cases. But the, what is this 100%? In all cases, with the exception of something, and the something is small, provided there is a lambda sigma zero, because that something has a, has a, is multiplied by L1 side. Now, because I went, uh, I guess, by my computer three minutes over time, let me jump over these things and just thank you for your attention.